Hey everybody, thanks so much for showing up today. Really excited for the event. I know there are still a few folks that are trickling in, but I figured it would be nice for me to just start. Something's always gonna go wrong in a live event. So we've got that one little thing out the way. That means everything from here is gonna be smooth sailing. Um, I just wanted to, first of all, just kind of give you a bit of background on you know, why we're here today and why Brown Watch is partnering with the Coding Black Females community. Um, so you know, the first thing I wanted to say is I am the VP of Global Community and Belonging at Brown Watch. I've been with the company It'll be a year this summer, and it's been an incredible journey. You know, at Brown Watch, we have three values, creativity, authenticity, and bold. And one of the things I really want us to do is be bold when it comes to belonging. And one of the ways that we do that is leverage all of the incredible people and skills and resources that we have within our team, sharing them with amazing impact-driven communities like yourselves. And when Charlene, the founder of Coding Black Females, and I first started brainstorming about all the cool things we could do together over the course of this year through our partnership, one of the things we kept coming back to was product and design. You know, this is one part of tech which continues to be underrepresented. And I know from my early days of tech that it can be so hard to just get a foot in the door. And even once you get a foot in the door, it's then so hard to try and understand how to keep leveling up and getting new opportunities. And as people underrepresented in the workplace, we face unique challenges that impact everything from our self-confidence to our self-belief to even the way we can access opportunities and build a network. So I started to think, well, how can I answer some of these questions and help people solve some of these challenges with the Brown Watch group? And I immediately thought of some of the most talented, incredible women leaders in product and design at Brown Watch and ask them if they'd be willing to come on stage today, open their hearts, open their minds and share all of the learnings and lessons from their incredible careers. Luckily, they said yes. <laughs> so that's what we're here to do today. It's going to be a super informal conversation, um, really just pulling the curtain back on what it's really like to navigate this industry as a woman. Um, of course, we're all unique. We have different lived experiences, different privileges and different challenges, but there's still so much that we can learn from each other. And I always like to think of, you know, that idea of standing on the shoulders of giants. You know, all of us at the end of the day are here because of all the work that's come before us. So, you know, come to the session with all the questions that are on your mind. There's no such thing as a silly question or a stupid question. Whatever you're struggling with in your career right now, um, you know, I know we're all in different stages. Maybe you're looking for a job. Maybe you're trying to get further ahead in your job. Maybe you're looking for a mentor or a sponsor. Whatever it is, pop those questions in chat or unmute yourself and ask. I've got a few questions that I have prepared, but this is all about you. So I wanna thank you for showing up. That's such a huge achievement. I wanna acknowledge that you're already doing that work of investing your, in your career. And now that you're here and now that you have shown up, be greedy, you know, take what you can from this space, take what you need, ask away, ask away, and do not be shy. So I'll be your host, but without further ado, I'd love to hear a bit more from our panelists who I'm gonna be grilling today and who you of course can be asking questions of too. Um, I'm gonna ask our panelists to, Tell us a bit about their role, what they do, and also why diversity matters to them. So first off, Charlotte. Charlotte, please tell us about what you do at Brown Watch and tell us why diversity matters to you. Oh, hey everybody. Yeah, so my name's Charlotte. I um, am a product director here at Brown Watch. So what that means essentially is that I um, kind of support uh, all the way through the the, the flow of creating the products that we essentially sell. So from, uh, you know, ideation to um, implementation to like measuring whether or not something has been a success essentially, and then acting on it really quickly if it hasn't. <laughs> That's kind of what I do um, in a nutshell. Um, diversity is important to me uh, because, well, because it is important. <laughs> so, you know, um, maybe not necessary to to expand on that but I think also just um there's nothing more boring and frankly quite on kind of productive than to just keep discussing things with people that have exactly the same point of view exactly the same lived experiences all of this kind of thing 
uh, like as yourself and I just feel like you you never really move if you do that you just end up um talking about the same things all of the time so yeah that's probably me Yes, I love that idea that diversity also just makes spaces way more interesting <laughs> and makes teams way more interesting. Uh, so thanks for that reminder, Charlotte. Next on stage, Evie, please tell us about what you do and why diversity matters to you. Hey, hi everyone. Thanks, Abba, for this opportunity. I feel really, really honored. So I've been with Brandwatch for about five years, I think. I first joined as a senior UX designer and then three years ago, Katya offered me the position of the head of UX research. So what I do is mainly I'm looking at how to become more user centric. How can we involve the understanding of our users, really see their pain points, their wishes, and uh, what is the best way of them to actually experience our products. I collect this, all this information with an amazing team that I built together. And then we feed all this information either on a strategic level so we can inform the product roadmap and make decisions that are pretty much focusing and targeting the user problem. Or on the more tactical aspect of things, uh, we evaluate the, con uh, the, um, the functionality or the products that we are um, working on that at that particular moment. And then we are feeding that information to people like Charlotte. A product manager and to the developers so they can improve the products based on that feedback. So that's my main goal. Um, diversity is really important to me. I, from a very selfish point of view, I feel like I, can, I learn from, from various different people. I like different cultures from really um, early on in my life. I chose to live abroad. So I lived in various different countries. I studied in a highly diverse uh, environment and I just love interacting with people from different backgrounds and different cultures. Uh, from a le less selfish point of view, I just think that everyone should have the same opportunities in life. So we should embrace that. Thanks, Evie. And yeah, I love how I often hear people's experiences like first-hand experiences of like just embracing different cultures and different experiences is what makes them then never want to take diversity for granted and it's almost like you start to crave it I have a similar experience just growing up in a multicultural home and then having a dad who was a diplomat diversity was the default so it now feels weird to me if, if it isn't there because it's kind of like guys it could be so much better um so yes thank you so much for that Abby certainly not um yeah last but not least Katya please tell us more about what you do at Brandwatch mm -hmm. and tell us why diversity matters to you oh thank you thank you for having me um and listening so I'm Katya chief design officer here at Brandwatch um I am part of the founding team of Brandwatch so 15 years ago when we grounded the company, um, we were roughly 12 engineers and one designer and that was me. And so I have progressed from uh, those very early days to learning on the job, I have to say, and building and scaling teams, elevating, I think the power of design. Um, and um, now I'm in the fortunate position of having um, actually quite a diverse team, at least culturally diverse. Um, uh, I think why I think diversity is important, um, probably because difference is our teacher. <laughs> if there's one thing that I've learned, um, it's fundamental to creativity and innovation. Um, it breaks down preconceptions, um, in some cases like fear, um, fear of the unknown, it's a medicine to ignorance. Um, an environment lacking in diversity um, will struggle to survive. Um, I strongly believe that, so. Yes, I love that. And nature would prove you right. <laughs> Not that I'm an, but an expert, but biodiversity is definitely a thing. Um, <laughs> so thank you so much for those wonderful introductions. Everybody in the audience, I just wanted to let you know we've just launched a poll and we would love if you could take a second to fill it out. What we'd like to know is where you're at in your career journey, whether you're still studying, whether you're looking for a job, whether you're maybe in the first five years or the 
next five to 10 years or 10 plus years, it would be really great for us to understand. We've got some you know, questions lined up that are really geared towards helping you get the right advice to build your career. And yeah, by understanding who's in the room, each of our panelists will be able to tailor their responses <laughs> to ensure we're sharing what's most relevant for all of you. Um, so yeah, if you haven't had a chance to fill out the poll yet, please do, it'll only take a second. It's looking like 36% of us are actually looking for a job. So hopefully there'll be some really good gems around how to beef up your resumes and your portfolios. Um, and we've also got the next highest fraction of people, 21% have been working for over 10 years. So go us. Now, to be fair, I did fill in this poll, so that could also be lots of people on the panel. <laughs> All right, so my first question is really about breaking into your first paid gig. I remember when I was still working in the city and I really wanted to join London startup scene, but it was really hard to. And I remember getting loads of rejections. And finally, 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 I found someone through my university network that was working at a startup called Groupon who referred me for a role and got me in. And I'm so grateful that I had that privilege of having that network to be able to leverage it, but getting your first paid gig, whether that's freelancing or like full-time in a company can be so hard, especially as women in tech. So I wanted to hear from Charlotte and then Evie and then Katya, how you got your first paid gig doing what you do in tech. <laughs> Charlotte, you'll go first. Yeah, sure. So um, I actually started with Brandwatch uh, through a completely different route. So I, my sort of background was in research. And so I started as a researcher in the company. Um, and as part of doing that, I got really familiar with um, the platform that we, that we have. Um, and so I sort of inadvertently started developing the skills that I needed for the role that I have now. Um, and I think I didn't necessarily really realize it or specifically even really work um, sort of towards it. But then a, a product opening um, came in our, in our department and um, it, uh, I, I sort of applied for it and, and I got it. So that's kind of how I landed in product. I think it's often that way with product as an industry is that you kind of a lot of people often land in it by by accident almost um and then when you're in it you realize that you you've um you've got the skills from like all of these crazy things that you've done in in your career and you can put them into practice so that's how i got there amazing and that's really cool to be reminded that there are organizations where there are so many opportunities to like move in between departments and move between roles i know there are still a lot of folks out there who kind of think if I haven't got this specific skill set or haven't done that specific course, then that path is completely closed off for me. But I feel like what your story is telling us, Charlotte, is that that's really not the case because you can develop those skills in, in an organization. Yeah, definitely. And even I think you might have a different, so we've got a couple of people in the team that have been quite open about wanting to get into product but doing something else, they're sort of saying, well, I'm doing this job because on a longer term basis, I do want to get into a product role. Um, so I think you can consider which jobs are actually adjacent to what you're trying to do and, 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 and in a company that's big enough for you to make that movement. Amazing. Thanks so much for sharing that story. Evie, on to you and the world of UX. How did you land your first paid gig? <laughs> So let me first say that I've had two creative careers in my life, and I very often feel that I've had two lives and two beginnings. The first one was an architect, so I was uh, I, I, ha I have a bachelor of art in architecture, and I want here to say that I have a massive privilege. So I was born and raised in Greece, and in Greece we have free education for all. So it was a massive privilege that I feel I do. I only felt how privileged I am about that when I lived in other countries when uh, when that was not the case. And one of these um, countries is the UK where education is really expensive. So I started by studying and then I did a master's and in Holland and I did the master's. It was a master of science in interaction design, UX now, it was a long time ago. And that was paid, but I also managed to get a, a scholarship for that. So it was again paid by the government. So massive, massive uh, opportunity there. Not everyone has that chance. 
Uh, I feel that my qualifications have, have helped me vastly to find that initial job. However, in the UK, you do have that chance, that chance that Charlotte was saying, to actually say, you know what, I may not have built those qualifications by studying in the academy, but I've worked a lot. I've I definitely built the skill set and experience to actually move on a, a role that may initially look different, but I definitely know how to um, kind of like col collaborate in a, in a business environment. So I, I learned how to work with people that they had different background as me, but they have equally important qualifications and roles. So I would say my first one was uh, based on that, uh, but the things I learned within the first year uh, as a professional that don't even count half of my education in the academy. There are loads of resources at the moment to gain the qualifications that I spent six years gaining uh, into within a year or so and at your own pace and at your own time and with financial support. So I'm happy to share these resources later. That would be amazing, Evie. And I know that there are a lot of folks that are still studying, uh, which is great. So maybe some of these things could help point them in the right direction, but there are even more folks in the audience today who are looking for a job. So those resources would be super helpful and we can definitely follow up with Coding Black Females and get them to you. All right, Katya, what was your first paid design gig? How did you get that? <laughs> Hmm. So I echo what Evie said there, actually, in terms of um, I'm old enough to have done a degree <laughs> at university in this country when you didn't have to pay for tuition fees. So um, that was in the early 90s. Um, so I got a bit of support from my parents um, and I was able to take out a very small loan to help with, uh, you know, living expenses. And so it's night and day different what you're experiencing today. Um, and as part of the course in the second year, we had to do an apprenticeship and we had to find that apprenticeship for ourselves and apply to agencies um, wherever we wanted to and try and secure something for the summer term. So I decided to um, look to uh, what was available in Berlin. My um, mother's from Berlin, so I'm half German. And I got a gig, an apprenticeship for the summer term. And that basically put me in touch with people who I could network with. And actually I secured an apprenticeship for then when I'd finished college. So after uni, I went straight out to Berlin and spent three months doing an apprenticeship um, uh, for, I think it was something like 30 euros a week. <laughs> and they um, uh, offered me a job at the end of it. So that's actually how I got, how I got my first job. Amazing. So an apprenticeship that turned into a job. Would you say that there were any things that you did during that apprenticeship, which I guess is kind of like an internship that really got you to that point where they wanted to extend an offer? I took on anything that was thrown at me, honestly. You know, it sounds a bit cliched, but if you're the person that's sitting there late at night photocopying for someone's pitch the next day, then that's what you did. So I think, you know, being open, being eager to learn, having that enthusiasm, having a good work ethic from day one, um, instilling a sense of trust in you. Um, those were the qualities, at least the human qualities uh, that I could talk to. Um, and then obviously if you can prove yourself that you can do the job um, on those attributes, I guess um, that helps too, right? <laughs> yes, I like that. And you know, I do think it's fair to remind people of something, even if it's obvious, like trying to make yourself as indispensable as possible is so valuable and, and doing the things that people with more authority or influence in the org maybe can't really prioritize or don't want to do and making their lives easier can be such a great way, um, yeah, to be resourceful as well. And I think, you know, I see more and more young job seekers almost trying to like volunteer themselves to assist with something just as a way to prove their worth and show their value. And, and it can be really effective for building trust and, and showing off your skills. So yeah, either seize those opportunities that are out there, even if they're not ideal, because they're not a permanent role, they are just a short term thing or an internship, or try to create those opportunities um, to build trust and, and show off your skills. Okay, so I wanted to ask a question around confidence. <laughs> and I know it's a journey and I know we're all working on it. I have some days where I don't feel so confident myself, 
But I feel like confidence is one of those things that's constantly evolving. So if I think of the confidence level I had when I first graduated, zero. <laughs> I didn't have a job. I didn't know how to like show up at interviews. I found the whole thing terrifying. Then I got a bit more experience and then that was great. But then I had lack of confidence around like being in the workplace and trying to develop my leadership skills. I really struggled with trying to take up space in meetings and projects, put myself forward. And even now at VP level, there are times where I might be in a room where I'm intimidated by other people there. So I really appreciate that confidence is a journey and it's also like a super personal thing. Like some days you're confident, some days you're not. But I wanna know from each of you amazing women, what you do to build those confidence muscles because it's so important to do that. So I'm gonna start with you, Charlotte. How do you build your confidence muscles? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> confidence muscles, love that. Um, so I think, like very much echo what you're saying there, is that I, I, I feel like every time I feel like I've grown the confidence in an area, then something happens and I feel like I need to start all over again, um, building that confidence. Um, and I think one of the biggest thing that I try to do uh, is be comfortable in uh, not knowing stuff and being comfortable in relying on other people that are experts within their field. So, um, and I think particularly in, 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 a, in a product role, you work with people from a wide range of industries I and mean, you're doing a lot of roles, but you kind of have to take it, you know, advice and input and stuff from a lot of different places. Um, and so quite often people will be saying stuff, talking about stuff, you know, um, for me, because I'm come from a commercial background, it's sort of deeply technical stuff. I don't necessarily know the details of it. And that can really, for me anyway, really knock my confidence if I don't feel like I'm an expert in, in the thing that's going on. And so the, the kind of muscle that I have been training is to go, I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand that actually. Can you, can you try and explain that to me in a, in a language that I speak? Because this is kind of not my language. And, um, and, 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 and sort of being okay with that and saying that, you know, instead of being scared of working with people that know more than you in things, then actually kind of saying, this is quite a, a you know, fortunate position to be in, that you have someone that knows so much about stuff that you don't know as much about, that you can say, um, you know, what's your thought on this? Um, but yeah, that's, that is the muscle I'm constantly training. I love that. Can I just say, I love that willingness to just ask for questions and admit when you don't understand. I actually think that's such a like sign of self-respect and confidence because it's like, I don't want to leave this meeting not even knowing what just happened or what I'm supposed to do. But I, I used to worry that if I asked for further clarification or I said I didn't understand that people, like everyone else in the room clearly understands. And for some reason, yeah. I cannot understand. And if I admit that, that's gonna make me look bad. But that's so not the case, right? No, and you always assume everyone else knows everything. And so often when you go, um, sorry, like I'm, maybe it's me, but I didn't quite understand that loads of people are like, yeah, you know, more questions and, and, and stuff. And it's just being prepared to be that person <laughs> that says, I don't quite understand that. And also, being okay with like being wrong sometimes you will say stuff and, and people will go uh, I don't agree with that and like the first time that happens that's really uncomfortable and really can can knock your confidence but um you know it's, it's it's a space you have to be comfortable in and once you get there I think it really trickles down and sort of the rest of your rest of your day in a way absolutely i also think you know you can kind of flip that around and almost see it as like a sign of integrity like if that conversation is important to you and this information is like important to you you know why not try and understand it better try to get more you know information out of that person i actually think a lot of times if that happens in a collaborative environment or anything people will probably start to see you as like the one taking it seriously and maybe you by asking the first question give confidence to other people to ask questions too Amazing. All right, Evie, over to you. How do you build your confidence muscles? So confidence is a massive subject. You have already covered uh, like a great, a great part of it. So I 100% agree with everything you said. And for me, it's also 
confidence is it can be really really different when when you're thinking about being confident in your personal life and being confident in your work life and you you will very often see people who come across as extremely knowledgeable confident confident experienced in work life but they might struggle in the personal the, the other way around so confidence is a massive a massive thing for us as humans right and um, so what i did at the very beginning, when I was also starting and feeling super um, like not confident at all when it comes to work environments, I thought, okay, well, I'm here to learn. I'm going to rely 100% on what other people say about me, which was, I think, a mistake. So feedback is extremely important. Constantly craving and asking for feedback is really, really important. However, this feedback has to be useful and helpful for you. It has to be constructive. It has to be um, well-meaning and it has to be coming by people who um, ha have more experience than you, have people who have been there, have potentially failed, same as you. Don't be afraid to fail. That's one of the definitely one of the adv best advices I can give. Um, and then with this kind of feedback, yeah, you can absolutely uh, grow and start feeling more confident. However, at some point I thought I can't possibly function like that. I can't go, oh, my teacher had a good comment about my work. I'm going to feel super confident. Oh, I had bad feedback. I'm going to feel really bad about myself. The same with my boss and everything around me. I try to find confidence from within myself. So in order to do that, I started looking at the effects. I don't know what was that. Um, the, I started looking at the, that the effect that my work had. So how could I actually see whether I'm, I was succeeding at what I was doing? Was I, was I making any difference? Um, that, that immediately kind of like helped me feel the confidence that I needed to, to proceed. I read a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. I went into that hole of, I'm going to take up this challenge even though it terrifies me and I'm going to read everything that I can, I can do around that subject in order to gain that confidence. Ultimately, what gave me that confidence is to try things. Read, tried, failed, great, learned. Let's try again. Trial and error is the best way to actually like really exercise that muscle and try feeling confident on what you do. And 100% what Charlotte said, learn from the people around you. You are not one person. You work in a team act like as if you're in team. I love that. What I like about that is that there's so much um, like understanding of self in that and that willingness to kind of say, OK, it's not going to happen overnight and I'm not even necessarily going to um, find the best fix right away. But if I keep trying different things and seeing what really works, then that's going to help me keep moving forward. So it's almost this reminder to really be willing to try different things and and rec record and, and remind yourself of what really is working and trying those things. And maybe also a reminder that what might be working now won't necessarily always work for you. So then you're gonna need a new tactic to help build your confidence. Is that right, Evie? Yeah, 100%. And also be open, because as we said before, you, we always make the assumption that we are the people who are kind of like struggling and really don't understand. We almost assume that everyone in a room is far better than us. We have to stop doing that comparison because everyone is human. You don't know anything about each other. And best assume that everyone feels exactly the same way as you. I love that. Yes, amazing. All right, Katya. So, you know, we've already heard your story. You started out in the early days of Brandwatch. Now you're in the C-suite, Chief Design Officer. How do you build your confidence muscles? So, um... I think confidence comes in ebbs and flows. And ironically, actually, when I started out after doing that apprenticeship, I was working um, in creative agencies with designers, creative folk who I spoke the same language, they got me. And it wasn't until I'd sort of left that environment and joined Brownwatch and found myself with engineers, uh, with computer science degrees, um, where actually my confidence took a bashing. So I went from feeling, whether it was just my youth and whether it was just uh, not feeling so intimidated by the world, uh, I had little exposure at that point. It was almost like, uh, as I got to know the world, um, I actually lost my confidence. 
and um, so it took a while to actually build that up. So I was trying to think, you know, what what is it that kind of helped me build my confidence? And it has to point to something around self belief. Um, and um, you know, that's something that you definitely develop over time and it is by taking on challenges and it is like by pushing through your fear. I think it is actually the fastest way to grow um, and that those knockbacks genuinely will improve your resilience. And with that resilience, you feel more empowered um, and your sense of self and your confidence in yourself, basically, like the real confidence that you, you're not faking it. It's like the thing that you inherently feel deep down confident to do. So um, in terms of advice, you know, I guess it would be say, try not to kind of, um, you know, curl up and run away from those really hard challenges because they genuinely, they will, they will pay off. Um, later on once you've pushed through but also I was just thinking about the people in my life everybody I hope knows somebody that makes them feel good about themselves and I do think it's important when you're feeling really down on yourself that you go seek out someone whether it's a coach a mentor a friend your mother your father just get somebody to make you feel better about yourself because you can lose perspective right you can be way too critical on yourself and uh, actually people can sometimes pull you out of that and be a bit more rational um, than possibly your own brain is doing. So look for that support. Yes, I love that. It's like, who's your fan club? Who are your cheerleaders? I have um, an iMessage chat with my two best friends. I don't think a day goes by or I don't message each other. Uh, we don't message each other. And if any of us are having a bad day, we'll be like, I'm having a bad day. And then that's when like we roll up and we're like, you're awesome. You're amazing. You've got this. You can do this. And we'll like send like empowering like ballads to like get each other cheered up and in a good mood. But yeah, it's so, so powerful. And, and I really, really love that tip because it's one that I used myself. Now, I wanted to say thank you, everybody, for all your amazing questions. This is so good. I promise I only have a couple of my own, but I saw that Ola, Ola T asked a kind of follow up question uh, based on what Evie was talking about. So I'm going to bring in Ola's question now and I'm absolutely going to come to the rest of yours as well. So thank you so much. Keep them coming. Evie, what you said about confidence from the inside, please, can you give an example of how you self measured your impact? It's something that Ola would like to try and do. Um, so first of all, you have to say, um, I think just even before going to your impact, you have to see whether there's actually a problem to solve. So for me personally, what I would do is sometimes we feel that we are trapped. Sometimes we feel that we are trapped in a job that we don't like. Sometimes we feel that we are trapped with in a relationship we don't like. Some, we, we very often feel trapped thinking there's no way out of that. I've been very, I have like multiple, uh, like numerous um, situations where I felt this way. In the past, I literally lived that, that thing and it made me feel really bad. And I just can, kind of continue working in an environment that was unhealthy for me, potentially for others. The first thing I, the first thing I do is to almost map out my experience. So where do things work well when where do things don't work well where are the pain points i think i think as a researcher so i apply my job into my life let's say so i map out all the good things that are happening in my work and in my collaboration with others all the bad things that can potentially be um in like improved and then and then I have a strategy and tactics about how to improve these things that can potentially improve the overall experience. I literally work the same way I work is the same way I live life. Um, so when you start kind of like improving these parts, you have to make sure that it's actually improving this for everyone else around you as well. So that's when you talk to people. That's when you do your qualitative research. That's when you interview people around you and say, hey, is this actually working out well for you as well? Uh, and then as a team, we we kind of like see that happening around us. Um, and this this naturally improves my, improve, improves my confidence because I feel like, okay, you know what? I've solved problems real problems that exist and now i'm seeing that by solving them these solutions have given me 
a way to feel more confident and move on, try to do that more and more. Did, this, did that answer your question, Ola? <laughs> yeah, Ola, feel free to tell us if you've got a follow up, but I love that like comprehensive framework that Evie set out there. I was like, mm, you can tell she's a researcher. She's put some strategy into this. <laughs> some real thought and methodical steps. <laughs> what, what a dork. <laughs> um, amazing. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, I've got another couple questions and then I'm going to jump into all of yours. And also, can I just say, like loving the energy in the chat because not only are people asking questions, but they're also sharing reflections. So for example, I like Ati sharing, you know, how she likes to reflect on the progress that she's made since the day before or the last week. And go you. I love that you're reflecting and that you're keeping your portfolio growing. Right, so I know we're, you know, we all are really passionate about creativity and nurturing our creative side. So that's what my next question is all about. Charlotte, I'm coming to you first. How do you stay creative in and outside of work? Yeah, so I think for me, the first thing to say is that creativity tends to be the first thing that kind of gives for me when I'm really stretched um so if I'm really busy at work I've got like meetings all day and all of these documents to write and stuff that you know then um you sort of feel a bit un unfulfilled so I think f for me personally I have to make space for creativity in my work I have to put in blockers and go you know this is space where I'm switching emails off slack and all of these things and I just think about things and you know draw stuff I don't draw very well but like write stuff down whatever it is uh, that you sort of do so at work that's my biggest thing is that I have to make space to actually um, be and think creatively because otherwise um, it just goes out the window and it becomes all a bit sort of um, practical um, and then outside of work um, I sort of I, th I think a lot of the sort of creative energy in my life comes through play <laughs> um mainly with like my my four-year-old but also sort of playing with like friends and you know the sort of stuff that you do I think I get a lot of enjoyment out of just uh you know planning things um that are new and like those kinds of things um yes yeah, so I think that's the main main things that I try to do outside of work Nice. I like that. And I like, I like play. I mean, I don't even have kids, but I like to play. And I think it's true. Like spending time just in the pursuit of joy, not in the yeah. pursuit of productivity um, is really, really important, especially I think because one of the downsides of tech is that there's a real like productivity obsession and like a real hustle obsession. And if you spend too much time on like tech yeah. social media or like reading tech blogs, you might feel guilty for any minute you spend that isn't like, generating revenue or like working on a project but i think that's that same energy that leads so many people to feel burnt out and low and actually yeah like you know creativity is what drives us what drives our problem solving skills what drives um our work and builds our personal brand and sometimes how you build on that is actually doing something that is quite far removed from work right yeah, totally. I think if you focus too much on the actual output of why you are being creative, it doesn't feel very creative at all. You just kind of feel like you're doing a job and it's not not much fun. But if you're doing it because it's something you genuinely enjoy and, you know, I have to say I enjoy playing with my own friends more than playing with my child, they're more fun. But it's kind of if you're doing things out of the enjoyment of it rather than the, the job of it, definitely. Amazing. Such great advice. Thank you, Charlotte. Evie, over to you. Maybe you have another framework for staying creative. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I don't, but I had a huge realization a few years ago. So three, about three and a half ago, I, as I said before, I moved to a, from a very, very creative hands-on design role to a more managerial, managerial role. And my first thought was excitement, but also am I going to lose the cre creativity from my work because I live in creativity. I, I, I'm naturally a creative person. What I, what I was thinking back then though, was a little bit of a misconception around creativity. I thought creativity is what I was doing in the past 20 years up to then, drawing, designing, uh conceptualizing all the things that i thought if i'm not actively doing them i'm not creating which is not the case so i soon discovered that creativity is in everything and 
for me, creativity comes comes usually in bursts. I don't know if it's the same person, but uh, the same thing for for most people. But for me, I have really creative periods, and then periods where where I might as well just fill in a spreadsheet and do nothing else. And then and then it comes again, and then it goes down again. And I think that's almost like a coping mechanism because you can't possibly be constantly bursting with creativity. That's going to be exhausting. So what I found in my job at the moment is that mentoring others can be really creative. Um, so I build a team now and they do the creative stuff. I help them do the creative stuff. I give them ideas. I give them frameworks. Frameworks can be super, super creative. Like strategic thinking is, I find it now even more creative than I used to do before because I know that it has a longer lasting effect than designing an interface unless the interface remains for 20 years, which is not a good thing. Um, creative workshops, I love workshops. Uh, it's a lot of creativity that you can put in, in designing a workshop that brings together creative minds to collaborate on solving problems. Any sort of problem solving has some creativity around it. So I'm definitely not lacking creativity in my work at the moment. Personally, I wish I had more time. I don't have a huge uh, time anymore. I am a working mother of two young children. I have a six-year-old and a three-year-old. I'm not as a, an amazing mother as Charlotte because I do not enjoy very much playing with my children. I find playing with a, a three-year-old honestly a little bit boring, but I try to do other things with them to feel a little bit better about myself. So I make them handmade costumes rather than buying uh, ready-made. I um I may create a game for them to play so that they can move a step away and do things that I like. Um, baking, I love baking with them and for them, mostly for them rather than with them can get really messy. Uh, but I do love baking a lot and, and tasting my bakes as well. And I also uh, have kind of made my first profession, turned my first profession into a hobby. So I really like home improvements, DIY, finding affordable ways to do interior design. So that's what I do in my free time, which is very limited. Amazing. Yeah, that's so cool. And um, you say you don't have time, but it sounds like you're doing a lot. <laughs> Never um, <speak. laughs> I want to see more of your baked goods in our Slack channel, Bakers of Brandwatch, and more of your DIY projects and other projects in our Creators of Brandwatch Slack channel. Um, I, did not, I didn't even know we had these Slack channels. <laughs> ah, Bakers yeah. of Brandwatch is so good. I mean, I'm, I'm totally a lurker in that Slack channel because I cannot bake. I don't have the patience for baking. I'm, I'm a savory chef kind of person, but it is really fun to go in there and see what people have done. Anyway, um, thank you so much, Evie. And I, and I love that idea of also thinking of like, you know, similar to what Charlotte was saying, like how to be more creative in our professional space, the way we approach things, the way we operate, but then also, yeah, the opportunities to foster creativity when we're in our personal life. I was going to say when we're back home, but I was like, oh, wait, we work from home now. So that's not a good phrase. <laughs> um, anywho, um, Katya, I can see like some hints to the answer behind you in your scenery, but how do you stay creative in and outside of work? <laughs> oh, thank you. Well, I, I'm just trying to think what I can add to what Evie and Charlotte said, because I totally relate to everything they said just then. <laughs> Amazing. Um, so I, it was spinning around in my head and I thought, well, I guess if somebody switched off curiosity, I would struggle. So that kind of, we all have that within us, like we can be curious and uh, you can go where your nose or whatever, like follow your nose. Um, so for me, like I think Charlotte, you might have said something about this, but daydreaming is huge. Uh, I am time poor. Um, so for me to be able to just capture those moments where I can daydream, whether it's in the bath or, you know, on the drive to school or whatever, um, that, that daydreaming is really important to me. And if I don't have it, I'm, I'm starved somewhat because somehow then I'm not, the synapses aren't kind of like working around like random ideas that pop in and indulging those random ideas as ridiculous as they may be, as, as much as they may never happen. <laughs> but um, I, I think that is a creative process that you go through. And um, the curiosity thing is literally just, uh, 
actually to your point of diversity you know when when everything's the same that's when you start to go dull that's when ideas start to uh not spark and 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 so you need that that's what we're all struggling with lockdown right it's like it's too much of the same every single day um so i think i think diversity curiosity daydreaming random conversations with random people um as the things that trigger ideas in my head like you can't anticipate that stuff and if i do have a bit of time yes i try and splurge with paint um <laughs> amazing i really like that reminder that daydreaming can be a real spark of creativity i'm reminded of artists or other creators that when they have a block might go for a walk or go for a swim or basically try to do something that actually takes their mind off of the task and suddenly just by being free to wander it's like the floodgates suddenly open and everything comes through and again it's just that reminder to almost do the thing that doesn't feel like doing anything <laughs> to help get creativity happening right yeah, I like to use that as an excuse for being very easily distracted. <laughs> I'm not one of those people that is like focused and you can't approach, you know, distract me. Um, <laughs> but actually, you know, there is a benefit to that because then when you come back to the job at hand, you suddenly got an idea. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much. Those are so many great, great responses. And I kind of wanted to take notes myself, but I can see that this is being recorded. So I'll just have to rewatch the recording when I need to remind myself of all the great advice that's been shared. Right, well, finally, I want to come to your questions. I'm really grateful that all of you took time to be brave and share what's really on your mind right now. Um, I also want to give a shout out to our Chief Product Officer, Bex, who's here in spirit and, and physically and virtually and showing her support. If you're wondering who this lovely pink haired lady is, she leads all things product. Um, and also how cool is it that we have two women in the C-suite at Brown Launch, love that. Uh, anyway, <laughs> over to your questions. So um, let's see, I'm scrolling all the way back, back, back to the top. So I can see that we've got Lorna in the room. And by the way, if you ever need to ask like a follow-up or a clarification, please feel free to unmute. Um, so Lor Lorna wants to get into UI UX or build up her UI UX skills. She says that she sees a lot of courses for development, um, but not really many for UI UX. So are there any that you can recommend for people that want to get into this field? Evie? <laughs> yeah, I can. There are loads out there. Um, I mean, one of the my bible for anything related to research based user experience that would be norman and nielsen or nielsen and norman group uh, you can have many many articles but they also do training their training is expensive though it's definitely less expensive than spending two years doing a master's degree um but it's something that it's it, it is an expense you can get qualifications by doing that. So as far as I remember, you can do three courses related to the, around the same um, the same areas, or let's say either UX management or UX research or UX design. They have some things about um, around UI as well. And then with three courses, you can get one qualification each. There are free resources as well. So there's a, an excellent um, app that's called Learners. You only need to, do, to register and then you have really good formatting. They have really short videos around specific areas on you know, certain methodologies or processes, frameworks, anything anything that you kind of like need to know as a professional or for professional in the field. Um, and you get you get talks from all the way from you know like the chief suite to to junior people starting. So I would say those two are uh, the best way to go. And if you get if you can get yourself into an internship, that's the best school. 
Amazing. Lots of really great advice there. Oh, and Lorna says, thank you, Evie. Very helpful. Well, yeah. Don't be shy, Lorna. You know, reach out if you see any opportunities at Brandwatch, let us know. And definitely keep working on yourself and building your skills and building your network. I hope all of you add us on LinkedIn because that's something that I used to be too shy to do. But it's just so important. Just be like, hey, I saw you speak at that event. Really love what you said. Would love to add you to my network because you never know. Careers are really long and the journey is long. And, you know, one day we could be really, really helpful to you. All right. So thank you so much for that question, Evie. Um, I'm going to come on to Shad's question now. Um, and Shad, as I said earlier, if you want to follow up to what's been shared, please feel free. Um, so Shad works in tech, but quite far from the UX space and doesn't have much room to shadow others due to limited roles. So what would be the best way to move into UX design or research? Would it be trying to get an, a master's in it? Or could there be other ways? I'm sure Evie has some thoughts on it. And maybe Charlotte can speak more around her experience of moving teams. So whether going from uh, from the master's academy route or, or, or the kind of like industry route, it really depends on the stage of your life you're in. If you really want to just dedicate yourself to learning, and you're not that bored, bothered at the, uh, at the at that side of your life with you know putting things in practice as you go, so learning as you go. I would say dedicate those one or two years and do just that, learn. So that that would be um, a side that you can go and just you can get yourself a big qualification that takes takes you have to put some time there, right? This is like a, it's a proper investment. Um, in the UK, I think masters are one year. The one I did was two years, so it was definitely an investment. Um, there are there are other routes. Shadowing is uh, is a really good route. And um, don't remember who asked this question. Shad. Shad. Maybe Shad. This is a a chance for you to move to a place where you can actually shadow people, where where UX is mature so what you want is to learn from people who have been there for a while uh, you want to learn from an organ you want to be in an organization where ux is it's already in a quite like high level maturity maturity right so you you want to see people believing in it you don't want to be the one that starting junior you can't possibly start working on getting the buy-in from from the senior people you want to be already in an organization that has that structure in place so i would say there are different ways different routes it really depends on what stage of your life you are at that particular moment amazing abby thank you um and chad you know feel free to ask some follow-ups let's maybe focus a bit more on that idea of like moving within organizations charlotte do you have any tips on either maybe how you made the case to management or anything like that <laughs> Yeah, definitely. So I think um, you mentioned sort of limited ability to 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 shadow people, and this could be because there is fantastic. the so the rock. Your start. <laughs> um, because the roles are on there, but it can also be because you might not want your current manager to know that you're considering moving into another one. Like, there'd be a lot of reasons why you don't feel comfortable, you know, just kind of going into the kind of role that you want and, and talking to them. But you can probably still observe, you can probably still observe what is going on within the space uh, in general, but also what's going on with the kind of people. Are they doing any presentations to the company? Are you noticing anything? about the, the the tech that you are working with and, and what can you bring from the skills that you already have? And then start to kind of paint the picture of like what what is it that you are bringing from your side of things? Um, because you can come in and, and you might have a, a group of UX designers or product managers or whatever it is that you sort of want to get into. And they already know a bunch of stuff, but they don't know the stuff as well as you do. And so what you need to come in and do is really kind of say, well, this is why I'm important. And then, and this is what I can add. And then you might be told, well, you can't right now because you have these gaps, but then fine, then you know what gaps they are and then you can, you can work on them. I love that. It's almost like volunteering yourself to add value. And if people are showing you how you can add value, you can be like, I'll be right back with those skills. <laughs> That's amazing. Thanks so much for that advice, Charlotte. Okay, Bookie, we're coming on to your question now. 
as I understand it, Bookie, you're looking for a job. You've said that for UX and UI design, you struggle with how to create case studies because you're not sure what employers are looking for when they're asking for case studies. Um, so hopefully I've understood your question correctly. Feel free to correct me if not. Um, maybe Evie, you've got some advice on this or anyone else on the panel, let me know. What do you do when someone's asking you for a case study? <laughs> I'm not sure I 100% understand this question. Uh, if I understand well, someone's actually had the request within your organization, someone asked you to create something for them. If you don't have clarity, don't do it. Try to gain that clarity first. If you receive a brief, you have to be absolutely 100% clear on what that brief is before you start and put in the effort that you need in order to um, deliver that, but am I understanding the question correctly? Bookie, feel free to unmute um, um, and let us know. Um, I'm just going to ask her. Ask there's her. actually another question which talks about how many case studies should one have in their portfolio before applying for jobs. Oh, okay. Oh, so, so you can get connected in some way. But is that is that? Are you basically saying? you know, I haven't had real life experience yet to accrue a real life case study in order to put that into my portfolio when I'm applying for a job. Mm, yeah, that would be good to know, actually. Um, so yeah, either Bookie or Ede Wede, hopefully I pronounced that right. Um, feel free to, yeah, either unmute or follow up in the chat so we can understand the case studies challenge a little better. Um, yeah. I can do that. Sorry if you hear the cooker in the background. I'm in the kitchen. Okay. Um, so I'm trying to create my portfolio and they're asking for case studies. So I study business economics. So case studies is a very new thing to me. And I'm just struggling with how to format the case studies, what they're looking for in their case studies, just trying to make sure that when they look at my portfolio and my case studies, they're like, okay, despite having studied business economics, she has shown that she has she has talent and she has the capability to be a UX UI designer. Okay, that uh, that makes sense. I took it on a completely different route. So case studies to basically showcase the work that you've done in your portfolio. So you, in my experience, case studies are real, real life um, situations. Uh, so when I created my uh, use, use, um, uh, case studies in my portfolio, I based it on real life examples. So my first um, kind of like tip would be to not create imaginary case studies, like be honest with the fact that you are new to, to this industry and that's okay. So I would most likely base my, my case study in what can I bring from that from from the from that you know existing learning and experience into this, and what the first thing that you can imagine um the, really what do you need to do the first thing that you need to do when you enter the UX world is that you you need to have empathy you need to understand the user problem you need to be user centric so naturally if you think about it in almost every job there is out there somehow we have someone that we, pro we provide service to. So how can we empathize with that person that is paying us to provide a service? And if you start having the mentality of being human-centric, user-centric, customer-centric, however you want to call that, then you can potentially extract useful information, like very useful skills that you can uh, kind of like use for your benefit. I, I mean, I'm, I'm. I, I, this is my suggestion. Imaginary use cases. You, you always find someone that will discover when they meet you in person and they start talking to you and they interview you. They will discover that this is not an existing um, case case study. So present to your portfolio everything that you feel comfortable talking about to in person with someone. That's great advice. Thank you, Abby. And hopefully, um, Ede Wede, that answers your question as well. You mentioned that you have just finished a UX course and just have one case study from that. Go to town on that one. <laughs> Get super comfortable with that one. Is that what you're saying, Abby? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You have one. Exactly. Expand on it as much as you can. Amazing. Can I, can I make a suggestion, actually? Because I've, yeah. I've interviewed a lot of people 
over the time. And I've also interviewed people who um, have, for example, maybe just dabbled with design and um, have, have not had like a formal education and don't really have a portfolio. And there's something about, um, particularly the discipline of design is, 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 is you are a problem solver. So as a potential employer, I'm really interested in how you would go about solving a problem. And if there's a way for you to be able to describe that through, um, if it's a visual way, or even honestly, if it's just how you're talking to me in an interview, um, that, that, that's like super helpful. So it's almost like I'm trying to understand how your brain ticks and how invested you are in, in this discipline to do it as a job, um, uh, where you, where you um, get your source of inspiration from, who you're looking at you know, in the industry, because actually when you ask somebody, who do you most admire? That tells you quite a lot about their style and their sort of, um, it does tell you a lot about a person. So I think you could get creative. If you don't have case studies, get creative and by the very fact that you go in and you don't have case studies but you've creatively approached trying to sort of like expose your talent um that that's an accolade that uh, some would recognize in you at least um i like that i just wonder then this kind of like connects to Atty's question because she's a designer would it be helpful to hook up with a web developer who doesn't have design skills and collaborate on something that we could then both put on our CV, for example, a small local project. Is that the kind of initiative you're speaking of? Totally, especially if it doesn't involve money, because, you know, no one's got very much money. So, I mean, if that's something that you can both gain from. <laughs> um, honestly, that sort of like appetite, right? That hunger, that creativity, that like, I'm willing to learn. It's it's. I'm willing to collaborate. I'm willing to be part of your team. It's um, it's you, that's the stuff that you really want to kind of like get out of yourself when you're in an interview. I just uh, just want to add to that. It reminded me of what you said, uh, Atty, because there was actually here in Brighton where I'm based. They've just started uh, an initiative to help small businesses um, that are not very um, digital become digital so that they don't crash in in this COVID crisis that everyone's having and they actually advertised for stuff that people that had time and abilities within the creative uh, sector to sort of try and help out these local businesses so maybe I can share the link to that later that might be helpful for some people who need some. Is that an exchange of skills? Exchange of nothing just time um, yeah, it's just kind of, you know, small businesses that maybe uh, have a shop somewhere locally and don't have a website and don't really know where to start and how to do a logo and things like that. Yeah. That's such a good point. You can create your own case studies. You don't have to, to, to only just expect your employer to pass you a brief so that you can have the opportunity. Just use your creativity in the time while you are actually looking for a job to create more case studies for yourself. That's, that's a really good point. And I, I can see already that there is some collaboration happening on the chat. People are already hooking up to create case studies. That's exciting. Well done, everybody. Keep it going. Um, okay, so let's talk about mentors. Ola was asking if you panelists have mentors and what advice you could give to help her find a product mentor. <laughs> Charlotte, I'll start with you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I do have a mentor, it's someone from within uh, our organization that I reached out to. I reached out to her specifically because she, I, I felt she, you know, from looking at the persona that she was projecting, I felt that she was possessing skills in the areas that I felt I could do with improvement in. So that's why I reached out to her specifically. Um, but I so had I, had I not had her, what I probably would have done is go through LinkedIn, find some companies that are where I admire their products and then reach out to them uh, on, on LinkedIn. Um, 
you know, some of the bigger ones probably maybe don't have time, but I know some of the smaller ones certainly will see these messages come in and probably reply. So I think that's probably a good place to start. Um, and then be quite clear on what it is that you feel that you need from a mentor. Um, and, 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 and then search for that specifically. That's awesome. Great advice. Anything to add, Evie, Katya, on finding a mentor? I think one of the things I really want to say is before I let you, I just saw you unmute Katya, but um, often people that sh like get asked to be mentors get asked by a lot of people. So it's really important to actually like be really like mindful, thoughtful, considerate and like personalized in how you approach someone, especially if you don't know them very well. So, you know, just using myself as an example, I often get people saying like, hey, I'm going see, I want to break into tech. Will you mentor me? Um, but they haven't given me like much to work with. Um, but when people are like really specific, like, hey, Abadesi, I've seen this job I want to apply for at Brandwatch. I think my CV is in the right place, but I'm not 100% sure. Would you spare 15 minutes just to help me tweak it? Then it's so easy for me to be like, yes, and then support them. So the more you can do to be really specific with your ask and, and almost like create a rapport with someone before you just like flat out ask, do you want to be my mem mentor? Because it's kind of like rocking up to someone and being like, do you want to be my friend? And it's like, well, let me get to know you first. You know, let me get to know you first. So um, yeah, really think about, you know, mentorship almost more just like, you know, a friendship and you wouldn't ask someone if they would be your friend, you would get to know them and you'd build trust and then you'd, yeah, exchange ideas and exchange skills and it would happen naturally. <laughs> Katya, I saw you unmuted. What did you want to add? Well, the thing is, Bex, our CPO with the pink hair, who did wave earlier on, is heavily involved in a young women's mentoring scheme. And I just wondered, is it okay to ask her to um, expand a little bit on that? Please. <laughs> Sorry, Bex, threw you in there, but... No, that's okay. I thought I was just here as Smile Squad, but... No <laughs> Um, yeah, so I um, I do work with a charity called the Girls Network, which is about connecting girls aged 14 to 17 with mentors. So that particular scheme probably wouldn't help for people on this call who are sort of a little bit older than that, I would have thought, and like, you know, looking into their, their next step. But there are kind of various schemes like that where people who want to be mentors go to be matched with people who want to be mentees um, and so you know you can kind of go with the approach that Charlotte had which is like I already know someone if you're lucky enough to already know someone in your network then that's great you can use that or you can go for the kind of bold approach that I was talking about you know I'm going to go to and Charlotte I'm going to go to someone on LinkedIn there's probably a midway where there's almost certainly a network that you could join where people have already shown their appetite to mentor and therefore you can kind of pick from a, a smaller list and, and hopefully someone will be available. And if for those that are already in the workplace, you know, we, it was one of the initiatives that um, uh, our head of learning and development at, at Brownwatch started. So we have an internal mentoring scheme and people volunteered to be mentors and put up a profile card about what they do, where they think that some of their strengths are. And then within the company, people could, um, uh, you know, ask to be mentored by, by any one of the people that volunteered that. So it could be an initiative that you could maybe suggest happens within your own workplace if, if, if you're already in a job, which the polls say um, a fair amount of people in this call are, right? Amazing. Fantastic advice. Thanks, everybody. Really appreciate it. Um, okay, so this is a great question from May um, about applying for roles when you don't meet all of the requirements. I'm sure we've all been there. Um, May is looking for a job. And, you know, one thing that May is struggling with is a lot of job descriptions are asking for at least three years of experience or formal education. Yeah. What does one do <laughs> when confronted <laughs> with these requirements? I have some thoughts, but I'm going to turn it over to the panel first. <laughs> um, well, I just, I've got maybe just one quick thought on the experience thing, I guess, like, um, so we've recently been recruiting and we had, you know, some requirements and things, and of course they're important, but I think they're not as important as the conversation and the everything else that follows once you, you get into it. Um, 
And I think that these experience that's being asked for can also be gathered elsewhere. So like, even if it's things that you've done yourself, if you started a blog, if you've done anything like that, then you are, you're developing something and that is experience. And so, you know, um, it doesn't have to be, I don't think it has to be um, direct kind of, I've been in the same role doing the same thing for three years. It can, you know, um, when I applied to join Brownwatch, I included work that I had like done for my now husband then boyfriend. Um, that is real work and you learn real things through them. So it's absolutely okay to add them to your CV. Totally. Bex, as someone that has an untraditional path into tech, do you have some reflections <laughs> on applying for roles where you don't meet all the things listed on the JD? <laughs> yeah, I don't think I've ever applied. I don't think I've ever had all of the qualifications for the job that I'm going into. I don't have all the qualifications for the job I'm in now, um, but, <laughs> but I'm doing it anyway, um, like successfully, hopefully, mostly. Um, and um, it's, it is hard because I, I find myself naturally thinking, well, I shouldn't apply for that. And I have to sort of manually override that because I know that my, my automatic thought is to go, well, I'm not, not qualified for that. And then I have to remind myself of the stats and say, no, I don't want to be one of the stats of the women who didn't apply. I want to be one of the stats of the women who did apply and maybe failed completely, but um, tried you know it, it doesn't take that long to put together I mean a good job just a good job application you should put some time into but the time investment isn't the end of the world if it didn't pan out either so like it doesn't it's not like you, you are you have to sort of feel this wholesale rejection as a person if it didn't work out you just think well the hour I spent doing that didn't pan out but I've spent hours doing plenty of other things that didn't pan out as well so you know it doesn't have to reflect on me um, and and the last thing on the experience piece is I tend to just I would just own it in the cover letter so like this is what I do have and why I think I what I think I'll bring and just you know you don't have to write I don't have this experience but just say like this is what I have this is what I'm bringing this is who I am and why I'm applying for this job and why I'm excited about it because from day one onwards in a new job, your existing experience means very little anyway. Like in, in some senses, like me yeah, some functional skills and some things you've brought up, but in every new environment you go into, it's completely different. So it's much more important to me when I'm interviewing to understand how someone's going to adapt to where they are now if I hire them versus whether they're gonna take something they've learned 10 years ago and try and impose it on a situation today, which wouldn't work anyway. Yeah. I love that. I love that. And, you know, the stats that Bex is referencing there, there have been so many studies that show that women will only apply for jobs if we meet 100% of the requirements. Like we really see that as a checklist and we're like, okay, I can't check everything off the list. I'm out. We won't even put ourselves into, you know, the ring. And compared to guys in the same studies, they'll apply for jobs if they meet 50% of the job requirements. And a lot of them, you know, end up getting those jobs that they only had 50% of the requirements for. So yeah, absolutely, you know, take that risk, go for it. Instead of obsessing over what you lack, focus on what you can add uh, and what, what skills you do have and what experiences you do have. Um, so yeah, I hope that will be something to inspire you today, May. Um, Can I add, given that the second uh, larger group that we have today is people who have more than 10 years experience, if you are hiring managers, it's really, really important that you are aware of these stats when you look at CVs. So you may say three years experience and you might find a female has applied, but she might you know, be just graduated. Just give, give them a chance. Have a look. Can they ultimately, can they provide the value that you're looking to see from someone who has three years of experience? Is it possible that they can actually offer that with one year of experience? Yeah, I really love that. And, you know, job descriptions have so much power. Like what I love seeing more and more, and this is what, something that we do at Brandwatch, you know, we really try to distinguish between what's essential and what's ideal, but you can learn it on the job. And I think it's really important, you know, to Bex's point, 
everything you're going to learn is completely new to everyone once they start new systems new processes new ways of working and that's totally okay and that's totally expected um so yeah maybe like take a pinch of salt when you look at the job descriptions too and yeah remember that okay i don't know everything but i'm still going to try um alrighty. well we're powering through the questions um some of the questions we've already covered as well so Ede Wede, i know you asked how many case studies should i uh, do I need, you know, as Evie said, all the ones you have, all the ones you've worked on, you know, you did one in your course, focus on that one that you did in your UX course and get really confident talking about that. Um, Ashley asked if anyone is running a hackathon for design, because that could be a good way um, to create designs. I mean, Ati, it sounds like you need to start uh, a <laughs> hackathon for design. We can get coding black females involved. We can get brand watch involved, follow up. Let's make this happen. I think it's a really wonderful idea. I miss like real life and connecting like we all do, but yeah, going to hackathons used to be like such a fun way to just like meet new people and try and solve problems. And in my case, write some really bad Ruby. Um, <laughs> okay. What's happening in the questions? D. Ah, oh, so D, you asked a question which we've covered as well. You've been in the same developer role for four years and you're feeling like you'd like a change, but to stay with the company. Building on, you know, the example that Charlotte said earlier of moving into product, make sure that you are building those connections with people across the organization, showing off your skills and how you can add value and crucially getting that feedback, understanding from those teams that you've targeted as ideal that you want to move into what they feel you're missing so that you can keep working on that and come back with a track record and examples that show that you have those experiences. So good luck and hopefully you'll get into a new role soon. Um, let's see, we had another question about case studies. In case studies, do, ex do employers expect to see the complete design process? That's from J JV, Javi. I'm seeing you shaking of heads. No. What are the key things to show? Just the final product. And, and oh, the Katya, thing did, you, did you want to go? Um, I was looking for the question. Could you just repeat Yeah, that? so um, it's from JV or J yeah, J Javi Katebe. With PDF portfolios, could you advise on the necessary content, please? How many case studies should be included? Do you expect to see the complete design process? Um, well, I guess it does depend what job you're, you're applying for. Do, um, do I'm assuming product designer here? Yes. Yes. Um, I don't think, I, personally, less is more for me. <laughs> So um, there isn't that much time in an interview and often people are quite time poor beforehand in terms of actually looking at what you've sent through. So I'd rather you tell a good narrative uh, around one or two examples and that we're able to spend more time kind of connecting as humans um, than, than kind of having 27 uh, things kind of fired at me <laughs> um, in, in an interview. Um, you've probably got the design process covered. You know, if, if you're saying, I need to see something that was from conception to the finished article, no, not necessarily, not if you were not involved in the whole journey. If you were, then for sure, show it. But if you were just, in, you know, showing parts of the process that you're most proud of, and actually that's another thing, genuinely like put in the stuff that you are proud of and that you can speak to authentically and explain why you're proud of that even if it isn't the whole process um that tells us quite a lot um yeah i i, I don't know whether evie or charlotte you agree or disagree i 100 percent agree i cannot if if you have the comments uh, on that I, I think it's also really important as you do katya to show the other side of the of the picture as a hire manager so i recently was hiring um for three people in my team with a, with with similar job titles i had to review about 230 cvs plus portfolios plus cover letters that's that takes a lot of time and you obviously are looking for the first version so you want to, you want to have a balance of of uh, putting enough attention there so that you can actually quickly identify the best person for the job, but at the same time, you don't want to spend 300 hours on reviewing every single detail of those CVs. So what 
and this is my advice, and this is my experience as a hiring manager, so it might be quite different to uh, Katia Spexis and Charlotte's, but what I feel, uh, and because we do have these three things in, uh, in design and research, which is um, cover letter, CV, and portfolio, not many job, uh, jobs have a portfolio in place. The first thing I would look at is the CV. I will look for the CV. If you caught me on the CV, then I will look at your cover letter. And then if I'm, I'm caught there, then I will look at your portfolio. If you've lost me on your CV, on the, on, and the CV doesn't always focus on previous work experience, right? In your CV, you saw your skills. You saw to me the value that you can bring to the company by doing this role, right? I'm not going to count job titles and previous experience. I'm going to see what the value it is that you bring to me. Preferably, try to do that in one page. If you don't have a huge amount of experience, that's not the challenge. The challenge is to fill the CV. If you have a years of experience, it's quite challenging to try and fit everything in one. So there are many formats uh, around the CV. My preferred one is the, the uh, newspaper approach, where you can have sections that showcase the different things in your CV rather than having a big row. So you can easily read them. You need something that catches the eye really quickly. Bullet points, don't write you know, massive phrases and sentences about one particular role. Like give me the bullet points. What were your responsibilities in that role? What was the value that you gave? Who are the people you collaborated with? That's all I want to know in, from your CV. And on cover letter, show me the value that you will bring and show me why you're interested in working at Brandwatch. What is it that attracted you for this job? You have to make us special as well, feel special. Like, why did you choose us? Uh, and then I will look at your portfolio. And at your portfolio, I want to see the output of your work, which is the last thing. Because ultimately, this is a skill that you can grow and learn and improve. That's super interesting because I do it the other way around. Do you? For me, the most important touch point is the cover letter. It's the thing that I start to scrabble about for first. It, it gives me a flavor without actually being any what sort of biased by what I'm seeing in the CV. Um, the, the, there's the cover letter and there's actually how the information is laid out. And that is like super important, um, obviously as a designer, as, as a designer because this is the first touch point that they have with you and your aesthetic right so don't underestimate how you lay it out um saying that i did hire a designer who's still with us today who when i hit print for the cv because somebody had to print it out had tiled it in such a way that it was made up of a3 sheets and about 12 sheets came out and had to tile it together to the CV. but i hired her her her, her cv was absolutely shockingly awful um and i can't take the piss out of her now because she's been with us for six years um but it was i now know who that is <laughs> <laughs> but it was her cover letter it was it was the spirit of um lily that came through in that covering letter that made me want to interview her i could have honestly i could have ripped that cv up didn't really Play. You're right. Cover mm. letters are massively important. But, but there is something to be said that certain disciplines do require some technical, let's say, knowledge that, you know, there are some boxes that need to be ticked sometimes for some roles. Um, so, yeah, do, in that sense, doing your research up front is, is helpful for what my <laughs> basic requirements in that sense. Yeah. Well, what's reassuring to know is that having a good cover letter and a good CV, depending on what's more important to the person on the other side, will set you up for success. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I really appreciated all that advice. And, and hopefully that will be really helpful for Nardia James as well, who has just completed a UX course and asked about getting work experience, personalizing to the people you're reaching out to, showing them why they are the ones that you want to be working with and why you are the person they should hire. and using your cover letter to tell a story that will separate you from the other candidates, as well as squeezing, you know, onto one page, all the most salient and compelling bits should hopefully set you up for success and, you know, be willing to apply for those jobs that you don't even meet all the requirements for um, just to get yourself out there. So best of luck. Here's a really interesting question from Clara. Uh, Clara is a returner, a program manager, and wondered if there are any companies that take older interns. 
I would definitely. Gosh, definitely not ageist. <laughs> I haven't actually had an older intern in that sense approach me, but um, yeah, totally, totally we would. Wouldn't we, Abby? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, you know, um, of course, like I mentioned earlier at Brandwatch, we do try to be bold when it comes to belonging, but I feel like more and more companies are doing their best to be inclusive. So Clara, make sure that you're not adopting a limiting mindset and, you know, not putting yourself out there because, you know, you're worried that people are going to like hold that against you, you know, just yeah, put yourself out there and, and try and yeah, definitely add me on. Can, I, can I say that this is not only expert skills that we are looking, we're looking at soft skills as well. We are, we are looking at people who can collaborate well, who can communicate well, and the, your age has definitely helped you create those, uh, develop those skills. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I think that's such great advice. And, um, you know, so much of our lived experience is what's brought us to where we are in our career like that's what comes out in our work and more importantly in our leadership you know I often think of that Simon Sinek quote I'm obsessed with him I think he's really cool um but he says that people don't hire you for what you do they hire you for why you do it and that's more and more the case as you get older so you know all of the things that you've been through have now created yeah unique value in you and maybe that's what you talk about and maybe that's what you what you lead with yes you might have had time outside of the office but that's still something occupying your time real life experiences that you've gained and that have helped you grow and that could help your new team grow <laughs> um okay well you kind of have like 10 seconds to get in more questions because i've gone through all of them now <laughs> and the event is ending with a prize draw for the attendees um so i'm just going to have another quick scroll through and make sure i didn't miss anything before i pass it back to jesse from the coding black females team La, 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 la. Oh, yes. And just so I could say, um, you know, the lovely ladies here at Brandwatch have decided that what they'd like to do in terms of resources that will help you with building your career. We're actually going to go offline and like gather a bunch of links and make sure that everyone that attends today gets emailed that um, because I I did want to ask them, you know, what resources they'd recommend, especially for people starting out trying to break in. Um, and they said they'd love to have some time to find the best bits to share with you. All right, so I think those are all the questions. Um, Jesse, I'm gonna hand back to you for the uh, prize draw, I think, which is happening now. <laughs> Where is Jesse? Hey, I'm here. Thank you so much um, to all of you ladies. It's been absolutely fantastic and a gold mine for advice. I have written down so many notes and I will definitely be rewatching this session as well. Um, Yes, so let me share my screen. So just before I get into the prize draw, I'd like to remind everybody of the opportunities that we have um, at Coding Black Females. So at the moment, we're just about to relaunch our Visible in Tech campaign, which is a showcase of your stories. If you would like to register and be part of this campaign this time around, please fill in the two minute survey um, the close date is next week, so we would like to showcase as many of you as possible. And it literally takes a couple of minutes to fill out. It was amazing last time, so please do take part. I'm stuck on the slide. <laughs> Another opportunity is the Makers Scholarship is closing on the 2nd of April, so do apply for that. And as well, we have our Black Code Her, which is the part-time boot camp, which is for yeah, becoming a, a developer, a coding boot camp. So make sure that you apply to, to these if you are interested, because they're closing soon. Uh, on to the prize giveaway. So these are two books that have been recommended by Abadesi. And so all of the attendees will be uh, entered. Give me one moment. <laughs> Let's put everybody's names in. Yeah, just to do another plug, 
ask for it is literally like a bible to me it sits here and it is a book written by two women that supported graduates entering the workforce and who realized that the women graduates and the guy graduates were reaching very different outcomes especially when it came to their salaries so they went deep into this research and built a bunch of case studies to show how women can ask for what we want in a way that gets us results so it's really really lovely and tailored to the unique challenges that we face so yeah hope you enjoy it amazing wow look at this wheel of fortune vibe this is cool <laughs> <laughs> i've never seen this before cool naomi are you here Please speak up or send a message in the chat if you're still here. I actually don't see her in the participants list. We might have to spin okay. the wheel again. <laughs> yes, we might have to spin it again. Okay. Are these all blank? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'll have to. Um, can I remove all instances of blank? Okay, that's better. <laughs> sorry about that. That's okay. the The challenges of live live zooming. <laughs> yes. Right, it makes it all much more exciting. <laughs> Nia, are you still here? <laughs> Maybe not. Okay. Third time's a charm. <laughs> Angela, maybe a moment. Let me try and get an up to date version of the, <laughs> the 10 things. Apologies, everybody. It's like the wheel knows. The wheel knows who left. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I will click uh, quickly add the list of resources I put together earlier. Oh, yeah. Can I add them now? And then we'll expand um, more because that's just a few things I quickly put together. Thanks, Evie. <laughs> oh, and I also saw that Deslin um, is getting some great advice around her question that I missed. Sorry, Deslin. What are some of the best ways to develop design thinking skills as someone looking to get into product management? I recommended the Try and Girls community because they've done a lot of events around, um, yeah, moving into product. Um, and Charlotte also shared some really wonderful advice. Uh, so hopefully that's super helpful. <laughs> and wow, Evie, so many resources, amazing. <laughs> so Jesse, how are we doing with our Wheel of Fortune? It's gonna. I'm suddenly... struggling to get. <laughs> yeah, I'm struggling to get the participant names. <laughs> Yeah, I might. And I'm just going to do a shameless plug while everyone is still here. Please do go on brownwatch.com forward slash careers because we are hiring. Um, and if you really enjoyed the, the, you know, the chat that we had today, um, this is a reflection of, you know, how much we care about this stuff and how much we care about this work and how much we care about empowering women you know it's amazing that bex is here because she's also the exec sponsor of our dni committee which i attend every couple of weeks and it's a space for us to come together and talk about the things that are impacting us in our daily lives and also to surface to the leadership of the company the actions that they can take to make our whole organization more equitable and more inclusive i am super grateful that i work in a company that puts so much effort and energy into this and that so many people from the top down are invested in that conversation i've worked in lots of other tech companies where that's not the case um so yeah you know not only are we building an incredible super innovative beautifully designed product we're also really lovely people and you know we'd always love to hear from you um so please do check out brownwatch.com forward slash careers even if you don't meet 100 percent of the requirements will you still please apply you know we love to keep resumes cvs on file and in our database and even if it doesn't work out that first time who knows we might reach out to you again um uh, with a role that's an even better fit 
Uh, so yeah, like don't be shy um, and do please, you know, connect with us and add us to your networks. We're just so grateful to even have had the chance to share all this information with you today. And, you know, we're really rooting for you. We're wishing you the best of luck. We know it's hard, especially when you're looking for a job. So please stay resilient, keep showing up to events like this, keep connecting with each other in this community, keep asking questions. And the right thing is going to land in your lap. Trust me, um, you know, persevere. You're going to get there. I see Lorna's got her camera on, putting a face to a name. I love that. We're going to find you that return internship program manager role. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> it's so cool to see you. <laughs> but yeah, really, really thanks, everyone.